So we were sitting, like I said, the genesis of this whole thing, us sitting together there, right? And so we, but we couldn't talk about it because it was a, it was one of these things where you're sitting in the audience and sort of nodding or shaking your head at each other. So we never, so why did you also, along with me, start shaking your head negatively when Pablo Alvarez said that thing about, I don't want to get involved in ethics? And what was your... You well, I, I remember, I, I was saying what that I said was that I trained as a photojournalist and um, I learned uh, from Jürgen Heinemann, who's an incredible photo, German photojournalist, and I learned from him one of the most important lessons, actually, to be an artist. And one of them was about um, taking responsibility for the position that you have behind the camera and then also how you through taking a picture, position your audience in front of that same subject. And um, to actually really feel the, re the consequences of these actions. And there, that is where, where uh, ethics come in for me, is this uh, reflection on the, on the consequences of your conduct um, as an artist. And I, I mean, there is, as an artist, there's the work that I'm producing, but there's all these, and I'm sure we all have that, all these interactions that lead me to uh, make work or to make statements, all the collaborations, all the conversations, all the, the, the interviews or, or questions um, and research that we do. And I think that there's, there are many, many um, moments in the making of work also before it even gets shown where this question of um, conduct and the consequences and the values and the meaning of that conduct gets raised. And I felt to... I, I, I know that Pablo doesn't think that, but and I wish he would be here to speak for himself. But I, um, it's it sounded in this moment of what he was saying um, that he wanted to move art away from this question of con like having a, a an actual consequence, um, a political, a social implication for the community who chooses to see the work or to chooses to engage in the work. And um, I I strongly disagreed with that statement. Yeah, but I feel like that's a, a, a sort of a <clears throat> familiar position uh, of uh, whatever postmodernism that you're going to, you know, move away from <clears throat> uh, from ethics and morals. So uh, I have a question then for Wafa, which is that at some level you're uh, putting yourself in front of that gun mm -hmm. uh, and allowing people out there just randomly to start shooting at you was asking people to do something that's unethical, right. is which is to shoot at a person. And so, but you're, you're sort of doing it, you're putting yourself there, you're, you're asking or, or inviting it to happen. So I was, I was thinking about that in a way, it, what you're doing is sort of uh, talking about ethics by a counterexample. Is that, would, would that be? Uh, what, do, what do you mean by that? The counterexample is that what happened is people shot you. So the piece exactly. was, was this unethical thing that lots of people did. Well, it was a dilemma for so many people, whether you should or, or not, right? Are you, when you shooting, are you supporting the artist? Or, or are, you, are you basically supporting the military? Yeah, because right? it's a complete failure of a piece if nobody no, shoots No, anything. exactly, and I think that's the argument through the chat room was just like running through the project. Uh, when people asking each other, why are you shooting? and the rest, the other people who are shooting, they said, well, shut up, without us, there is no project, right? Right, right? If we are not shooting. But beside that, I think um, uh, it was another action, if you don't want to shoot, and many people have decided to take that action, is to take the gun away by basically turning it left and oh, keep okay. it left, which to prevent shooter from uh, shooting directly. From actually hitting you, exactly. yeah. So that, two things, so first of all, that reminds me, I don't know if people know, <clears throat> there was, David Hammonds put a piece of uh, public art up in Washington, D.C. It was during an election, Jesse Jackson was running for president, and David Hammonds put up a, 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 a painting or a portrait of Jesse Jackson as a white man with blonde hair and blue eyes, and it had this quote, how you like me now, scrawled across it, uh, which was a quote from Cool Modi, apparently. Uh, I'm just... You know, this is what I've been told. So, after it was put up, almost immediately it was put up, David had to leave town, there was some delay. It was put up by four or uh, three or four white uh, uh, preparators in the African American community in DC. And almost immediately after it was put up, a bunch of people came and they saw a sledgehammer and they knocked it down. 
And so David then, uh, and so smashed up and down. So it's now uh, part of, it was put up back up, but he didn't want to take away those marks of, of destruction. And in fact, when he's shown it, if you see it now, it, he has a little lucky strike uh, cigarette, because he said it was, it was that activation, that act of violence against it, that activated it, and it got the discussion going. It was all over the press. So that, in a way, uh, that embrace of that, that act of violence against his peace was the peace. No, exactly, exactly. And I think when the peace was put up, um, it was in cold shoot in Iraqi. It was called domestic tension, and totally stripped out of any politics. In fact, you have so many people who are hunters, or paintball play players, or game players, <clears throat> coming into this encounter without knowing it's about an Iraqi guy who lost his uh, brother. But what I want it to be, I want it to be the project to be so naive uh, to the point it becomes a water cooler uh, talk, right? So it's just like, who doesn't want it to go and on the internet and actually push the press a button and shoot? But that was the act that, uh, in, in a way I describe it as the aesthetic pleasure, but the aesthetic pain, it comes slowly by the engaging in it, and you see the chat room that was running 24 hours. But also, Lapa, I mean, part of the work, I think that's very significant, is when kids sit in Denver and murder people halfway around the world, they aren't necessarily seeing them. With your project, they sort of had to confront you, to aim at you and see you, and actually confront that it's a human being and the consequences. Of the action, right? And, and so many people did not think that was live and true, so they tried to provoke, and some of them come even to the gallery to support or to protest. So uh, it was a multifaceted project, um, and I think that's what I what 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 I refer to as a, a dynamic encounter that really uh, does not impose, and it's a platform. It doesn't impose on the viewer any point of view, but rather establish. A platform it bring people from all walk of life to engage with each yeah, other. That's right. Okay, so I'm gonna just challenge him on this, and then we have. Do people have questions? Not yeah. Again. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, actually, you know, when I said before, is there anybody in this room who supports cruelty? And people laughed. Right. It's sort of like, no, because this is an implied set of, uh, of moral positions or, or that we hold, right? So that when you say to to say you just put it out there and there's not, a, I mean, the, I actually think that the people who are shooting think, ah, I kind of this is sort of cool. I'm doing something a little bit transgressive, even though I'm participating in the piece. That that at some level uh, they are playing around with with norms, right? That a, a ethical or, or moral norm would be it's wrong to shoot people. No, it's true. I mean, so many people who decided to shoot came back later and apologized and said, I am really sorry. I, I was tempted. I don't know why. I wanted to see what it feels like, but I'm terribly, deeply uh, sorry for that. And I think it is, it was an ethical question and dilemma for uh, uh, the audience to participate in it. But we have um, to talk about the objective of the piece and the artists as well. Sometimes artists have to cross these boundaries, ethical boundaries, in order to achieve um, the objective of the project. But the ethical line we cross, it cannot be uh, 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 worse or than the ethical line we're trying to uh, basically bring light to. Yeah, so I, and I promise I wasn't going to mention this, but I'll mention it anyway. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, uh, I don't want to get off into the discussion about Santiago Sierra, but if you were, if my project is to uh, diminish cruelty, here's an artist who, uh, for example, Take the paid yeah. uh, very poor Mexican laborers to masturbate in public. Or to, st to stay in, in boxes. Or to stay in boxes, whatever. Yeah. So then there's a question then of the, you know, how far you push the ethical boundaries in order to understand how far you push ethical boundaries. But, I, you know, you urged me not to talk about this, and I, I take it back. Don't. <laughs> it's too late to take right. that back. That's unethical. Yeah, it's unethical. I see a promise. I just broke a promise. Okay. 
I so. think, I mean, just to, because I have to put on the spot that I said not to do that, I think the, the I think there's a real difference, um, like what, what the work suggests is that you can only, or that the best way to talk about what he's trying to talk about, which I actually agree with um, to a certain degree, um, that this is the only way to talk about it. And I think this is for me where he fails as an artist because I don't, I think it's the provocative way to talk about it, and I'm not sure that provocation really is, has been proven a way of really creating a, a lasting discourse around um, what drive these, drives these things. Um, so this is why I always get a little bit exhausted to talk about him, um, because it, it, it actually proposes that that is the only, that what he wants to talk about, that this is the only way to do that. And then we go on and on and on, what other ways are That's what I was uh, referring to as a mental artist, as a mental reflecting a social condition. And I think that's what frightens us sometimes. We do nothing but hold the mirror in front of the society. And I think that reflection, because we like it, the society like it to be invisible. We make it visible. And I think that's where um, uh, the, uh, mostly the question about what the ethic um, of the artist or what the artist trying to do because the piece is threatening the public in a way they don't want it to be threatened. But can I ask you, because I think it's interesting, I like this, this sentence, I got this idea of the mirror, but I do think that, that art also does much more than this taking account of what's going on and making it visible. Like that would be for me, and I don't think your work is only doing that. It is actually pushing it beyond that, which is this question, this this call for action. I mean, you're calling, right. you're calling for a revolution, um, but it's this call of that there has to be a consequence from viewing this. And no, it's it's absolutely right because when that mirror is up, then the work starts. Not, yeah, yeah, not the act. Of exactly, exactly. Because then yeah. we we. I think that was a problem for many years, and I experienced especially here, is that, yeah, if people just would know how things are happening, things would be so different in the world, right? If they would just know. But we, at this point, have to contend with the fact as a society that, that the knowing does not um, necessarily trigger anything. Um, and, and sometimes that's what's wrong with political art, because uh, political artists hold the moral ground and they think they know better than the rest of the society, right? And I think it comes down to, it's like, no, it's, that's not true. Um, what we're trying to do is to trigger a form, but not impose our own ideas on the rest of the society. Okay. Uh, questions? Somebody promised me that. Yeah, uh, the yeah, the mic. Take one of yeah sorry. Who's, who's got a question? Raise your hand. Serious? No questions? Hey, so, uh, Clear it uh, um, It's not exactly a question, it's a little bit of an observation. I was thinking about, you said that if nobody was shooting for Wapa's piece, um, that, that there would be no aesthetic experience. But I can No, no, I said it would be a failure. A failure, right. But would, would it be a failure? Because why would it be a failure? It would just be a different kind of visual. Well, but that I think would be the thing amazing. is that, Yeah, I mean, that would be an amazing world to live in, right? But it would be an inaccurate representation of our world somehow. Right, but so it's a, cho it, it a would, choice to not do, as in... No, but what I, what I would think then is that he hadn't gotten the word out properly. <laughs> you know, because... He's coming from a curator, right? <laughs> <laughs> it would just mean nice people like us in this room were, were the only people looking at it. And, and if it's successful, like us probably shot it. Yeah, yeah, but that's probably true too. But I wouldn't be surprised if there were people who like to shoot, you know? Like there's a lot of people in America like to shoot. Not all of whom are killing people, but uh, it, it is a, a, apparently a fun thing. <laughs> no, and I, 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 I confronted people sometimes, just like saying, why are you shooting? And I remember one of them said, well, I'm a hunter of his cold and you are in season now, wow. right? So it's just like you can, you can see, it's like it's really, uh, just people like the shoes sometimes, you know? Yeah. Well, there was, I don't know if anybody was at Coney Island with the staff shoot the freak. Oh yeah. 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 Um, one thing though, which would be a discussion more of your work is this 
and I'm trying, I was racking my brain to remember, apparently maybe somebody in the room knows, knows the author, there's this really interesting book on killing that, that somebody wrote in terms of the, the change strategy of the military um, between like the Vietnam, starting in the Vietnam Dave War. Rosnan. Thank you. Um, and it's a really depressing and extremely interesting book, which I think actually goes more to the heart of the matter of how um, there have been, because I think uh, naturally, phenomenologically, like as humans, we, we are not, we would always resist to kill. I think that's kind of the, the kind of biological setup that we have. We're not physically, you can, we're not a killing machine, like that's not. Yeah. So um, there has to be all this psychological training actually to enable us to do that. Yeah, so one point out of the project is accountability and nobody, none of the shooter thought they they, they, they thought they were anonymous, basically, when they were shooting. They didn't know I, I was recording every IP address, basically. And there are some points when um, I hacked into their machine and stopped their guns. For example, MIT hacked into the gun and turned it to an automatic shooting on its own, destroying everything. So I hacked back into their lab and basically broke their computer. <laughs> so, um, so, I think there must be another question. Questions? Um, Dred, I was with you all the way until you talked about um, that you're accountable by not voting because I think the dilemma that, that really has been shown here is there is no way not to be accountable and you're equally collusive in not voting. So, it's just a philosophical having to suffer that sense that one way or the other you're going to be accountable. But my question was, I was with you into, through revolution until you said communist. And why communist revolution? And where did that go in terms of some of these issues? Well, I guess a couple of things. I mean, on the, the first point of not voting, it's not about absolution. It's not about feeling good because you don't vote. It's actually about, I mean, imagine if there were, I mean, even just a couple million people who, not out of apathy or just didn't show up at the polls, but there was a real question in society that was boldly posed of should people not vote, not because they, you know, you know, just don't like it, but because they think their votes actually contribute to harm, to actually, I mean, you know, Tom started, well, you know, is everybody for, is anybody in the room for cruelty? Well, I would expect almost everybody in this room that's over 18 voted. So you voted for somebody who both sanctions torture and absolves torturers of the previous administration. You guys aren't for that, but that's what you voted for. And so it, it, there is a real question of what if millions of people said, no, I'm not going to sanction policies and of people that advocate things I am morally and, and uh, as a human being opposed to. On the other question, where did communists go? This is a, we can get into a long question. I don't want to make, turn this into a, a discussion about that. But in the revolution, is, you know, in China, when when there when in 1949 the life expectancy was 32 years old, by 1970 it was 64 years old. The literacy went up drastically. They eliminated opium addiction. One of the first laws that was passed was for women to have divorce and then for women to have property, which in a semi-feudal and feudal society where people were sold into virtual slavery, that's a very good thing, a very liberatory thing. People were controlling the society in lots of different ways. Now, yes, there were problems with those societies, and just to be clear, China today is not a communist society, it's not something I support, it's a capitalist society, it has been since the mid-70s. And if we want to talk longer, we can. I'm more than willing to get more deeply into it. I have a lot of thoughts about this, and I, I could, you know, in short, say if you really want to get into it, I would say look at the work of Bob Obakian, leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party. He's looked deeply at the socialist societies that have existed in the past with an eye on doing better in the future and has a lot to sort of uphold about the great advancements that were made in those societies as well as the shortcomings so that we can do better next time. But I, I mean, and if Tom wants me to talk more, I will talk. Yeah, but I, I think, think uh, that, 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 that's just not for tonight. Yeah, exactly. exactly. We could talk later after, and you know, I'd be happy to talk. But I do more. think it, that actually that. You know, if one's goal is to diminish cruelty, these are completely legitimate questions to ask. <clears throat> and it might not be good for you, but overall in the society, and, and uh, I've only been to Cuba once, uh, but if you compare Cuba to, you know, Venezuela, 
where would you rather be if you're an average citizen? Is an interesting question to ask. Okay, but let's not get into that's not today's, because uh, the average citizen in Venezuela is pretty bad. Next question. Oh, um, Andre, I thought it was I mean, I, I deeply believe in photojournalism as a, as a practice. I mean, we sadly, partly, we don't see it enough um, in, its, in its breadth and its capacity. Um, I, I think that it, there is a, there's a different kind of, maybe to, to pick up what Thomas, Thomas proposing, an accountability as a journalist um, that you have to a project, to a research project, um, that, that has a certain kind of linearity and, and, and community that are involved, like the community that is in front of the camera, the community that you are putting in front of the picture. Um, there's a, a, a kind of very <coughs> tight line and, and relationship between those systems for me. And um, to move from journalism to art um, had it had it actually has a very had a very um, clear origin. Like I was uh, publishing in a magazine when I was a student already. I was published in a magazine that is kind of the equivalent of the New York Times magazine. There were many of that kind in Germany, the Zeit magazine, and um, I had several experiences where, um, as a photojournalist, you are if you publish in magazines, you are really at the bottom of the decision order in terms of the editorial. Um, so my work was constantly. Uh, be and recontextualized through subtitles, through um, article writing that was in complete disagreement um, to what my project was as a, as a journalist. And I think it was, for me, that was a very intense experience and I, um, uh, like I felt I was breaking my contract with the communities that I had been part of, the pictures that I had taken, and I had no way of, of um, Stopping it, you know, you pick up the magazine at the newsstand, and you open it, and you get a heart attack, and you know that many hundreds, hundreds, thousands of people are opening this at the same time. So it, it was a, a form of taking control, I think, as an artist, and we can, that is a longer conversation too. But there is certainly much more control over um, uh, th this kind of encounter of your work with an audience. Can I ask? Can I just a simple yeah. question? Um, in terms of the effect of uh, uh, photojournalism, um, I wanted to see what do you think of um, the idea um, of the decentralization of the distribution channels. In the past, very limited distribution channels. Then they come at the birth of the internet. And how did that change photojournalism or journalism in general? In terms of, in the past, we have very controlled distribution channel broadcasting us to us saying, this is what you should believe in. Then that changed because every one of us as an author is able or capable of becoming a distribution channel. But I think we were that before. I think, I'm not so sure. I've many years of really struggling with this idea of that the inf information I mean, I'm a real believer in the internet and what it can do, and as a platform of sharing information is of or, an organizational tool. But I, I think that there was, um, I mean, I was thinking about recently um, about uh, zines in the kind of gay liberation moment, and how um, there were, I forget the title of that, um, there was a, in New York, this very kind of famous zine published, magazine published, and they only had money to publish like, than no, 500. But because of the way they were like reading this thing, reading the magazine and handing it on, there was a there was a form of distribution that had a different kind of consequence um, because there was a social interaction, a conscious like an effort made, a real physical effort made of handing these materials forward because they were scars and they were therefore needed to be shared, and there was a. 
I've been thinking about this way how that also created a community. As you can tell, I'm a big believer of this notion of a community, and I I worry I worry um, the 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 shortcomings of, of the individualization through um, the electronic communication. So um, we have another question. Another question. Let me just uh, <clears throat> say that just to get back to the ethics uh, side of, uh, of that particular discussion, uh, one of the things that's discussed a lot is sort of internet ethics, right? And the whole attack on copyright and everything. It's sort of happening um, in a very active way in terms of the property. And, and, and there's you know, this idea uh, um, among certain kind of, uh, you know, open source activists that, you know, the greatest, um, you know, good is, is when you can sort of share something and get shared again and shared again. So there's this kind of other uh, ethic, uh, which I think is quite healthy on the internet, at the same time as the incredible depersonalization that can happen and these kind of assaults that you hear, the kind of internet discourse, which is so unbelievably over the top and insulting and violent. And let's go to the next question. Well, first of all, I, I would like to thank the panel for raising the issue of uh, ethics and questions of accountability, which are, I think, so important to respond to. Um, I was just wondering if we could go back to Pablo Figueroa and uh, reluctance to talk about ethics. Because I was wondering if it was tied into his uh, reluctance to put forth you know, best practices when it comes to socially, socially engaged art, and um, perhaps his reluctance to uh, put forth any opinions about um, bad and good art, um, whether the moral level or aesthetic level. I was wondering if you could. You know, so to me, I think that the problem is that he's not here, and that that we're all like really good friends of his, and we wouldn't want to speak for him. We could put words in his mouth. We could put words in. But it would be an ethical lie. But, um, no, I mean, it was just a trigger, and, I, and it was just a moment in which there, I, I felt like I don't even know if Pablo. It was just a side. It was almost a throwaway comment. Was this in the before context. I read the ethicist? <laughs> He had a magazine called the This the is it. Anyway. Yes, I think there are best practices. But I think that best practices are meant to be broken and all that stuff. So, um, you know. I mean, but that, that's for me is this maybe. It's, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Is that, that what's hard about really talking about ethical questions in, in art practice or in cultural practices is. Is it's a it's really hard labor. It's really hard work. It can never stop. So there cannot be a definition of best practices because they have to continuously work and engage and struggle with um, the the changes that happen around us all the time. And it's it's extremely precise. I'm not talking about a certain kind of relativism. I hate that stuff. But it's really this kind of way in which um, uh, values are something that that. That grow, that are work. They're not given. They're like they only exist if you work them, if you work for them, or if you work with them, or if you work um, uh, on behalf of them or something. But it's a process, and I think that's the the thing that that comes out of I mean best practice. I'd say, by the way, I'd like to revise my statement. I think there are worst practices, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it does. A lot of mistakes keep getting made over and over again. And the best practice is to avoid the worst practices. Um, I, but I, I also think part of the, the, the complexity is that people often don't really challenge what, what are ethics and what are morals. And, and there, it's assumed that there is sort of a universal ethic. Almost, and that I mean, in a certain sense, well, that I mean, the, the symbol saying like, that's unethical. Well, according to whose standards, where did that ethic come from? And the doing the hard work. Well, yeah, but I mean, at, at varying points in history, I mean, you know, it, it, to wind back the clock 150 years, it wasn't necessarily amongst all society considered either immoral or unethical to own other human beings. Now, even some of the most monstrous people on the planet think that that's repugnant, but nonetheless, they do things which. 150 years from now will seem awful. I mean, the, you know, you asked how I could, how could I be for communism? Well, I think the division of the world into the, the 
you know, a tiny, tiny handful of people that control the wealth and knowledge that humanity as a whole has created. And the great majority of people, I mean, half the planet's trying to survive on less than $2 a day. Perpetuating that world, including in the name of democracy, in my opinion, it is unethical. And, and, and we, sitting in this country of relative privilege, if we aren't working on that, then that's a real problem. M many people don't agree. Many of my good friends would not necessarily agree with that statement. Um, but the question is that if we just leave it as sort of a, a generic ethic as opposed to well, where did your particular values and morals and ethics flow from, what society, what production relations did they concentrate, then we aren't actually getting to what the real differences and possibilities are. Uh, it reminds what you were just saying. You were just saying um, reminded me of this. Trying to remember the conference. Maybe somebody else was there. Where Gayatri Spivak um, sent the feminist. It was a feminist con context discourse, something at Columbia, and she said she raised the temperature in the room uh, within a second by saying, like, we have to consider that there are communities where a body is doesn't belong to the individual but belongs to the community. And of course, that's an incredibly complicated situation if it's said de decontextualized in this way. Um, but I think it's what you're saying is that we have to, it's hard work to actually understand um, the value systems as they are constructed and come from other com communities and get off that moral high horse and actually really work through what it means to truly understand different kind of value systems. There's also a film that I recently saw that I want to point out to people, it's called The Light in Her Eyes. It's a film by uh, Julia Melzer and Laura Nix. It's a documentary where they um, accompanied a Quran school for girls in Syria, in Damascus, Syria, before the conflict happened. Um, and it's a really complex film because uh, the woman, it circulates around the woman who founded the, this, this Quran school in the mosque, and it's the only one that exists. And it is this incredible feminist pro context in the framework of um, kind of gender understanding in uh, the values of Islam. So it's a really, it's, it's an extremely interesting, complex um, document to think through exactly again these constructions of values. Uh, want, there are a lot of audience questions. So. I wanted to, yeah. yeah, forget about it. I have something to say. Okay. Um, so I. Uh, <laughs> Um, when I was working on a book that recently came out, you're all going to be embedded to a book, right? But so I was, uh, I had this idea that I had somehow come across the gold standard of best practices. And it came from a quote from Confucius, which was, if there's one word that you could base your entire life around, what would that be? And Confucius said, why not reciprocity? And so I was going to actually call my book, Why Not Reciprocity? And I went down to Cuba and I was interviewing Tanya <clears throat> Bruguera, who's standing over here. And she said, well, the problem with that, we had this long discussion about it, is it kind of gets an economic model of exchange. And, that, and this actually, I changed my title of my book, got rid of all this stuff about reciprocity, <laughs> and agreed with her. But it was that, that kind of moment in which you'd say, well, maybe, you, you know, the, the Within and this had to do with you know social practice you know the social practice art projects based around reciprocity which had to do with mutual exchange and equality, um, but in the long run, what what was convincing was this idea that it shouldn't be about expecting the thing back, but giving you know it's a so question. But I also don't like the word generosity, so I would would say that. Uh, there is an ethic of of reciprocity in every culture, right? Do unto others as you would have others to do unto you as a reciprocity ethic. Um, but anyway, I gave up on that. I just wanted to say that, that I thought I had found a gold standard. I got rid of it. Next question. Hi. Uh, a little earlier, there was a little bit of a conversation about the, 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 role, the role of this type of work, whether it's just to highlight conditions, conflicts, or whether it is to pro begin to propose something. And, the, the, and throughout the night, there seems to be a little bit of uh, hesitancy around the idea of partisanship. That unless you allow the work to be critical and ask certain questions, that uh, maybe you are uh, expecting certain results, whether it's the shooting, that someone's gonna shoot you, and that means something. 
Uh, and I wanted to see what you what you thought of that partisanship. Is the role of this work just to highlight conflict to, to try to intervene? But what is the role of that? Well, the artist is responsible. He or she is responsible for what they start. And the consequences eventually and the responsibility of their shoulders. Um, and what I was mentioning earlier is not the idea of I don't want to own that work, but rather that I do not want to impose. And I think these are very different um, concepts here. One is I am imposing on you. As an artist, I own the idea and I'm entitled to it, but I'm imposing that idea on you. I moved away from that kind of work because ultimately it is the same concept I'm fighting constantly, whether under the regime of Saddam or here or other places. And I find my role is to trigger something. And then the participant, and this is go to the notion of Benjamin, um, the idea of the storyteller. When you open that platform, you invite people to generate their own story. Then the story is retold through the participation of it. So really the idea is not limited to what the artist could generate, but rather what the participant could generate from that encounter. I have very clear values, positions, political opinions. I, as a, as a German moving to this country like more than 15 years ago, I thought that the term opinionate is a compliment. Because <laughs> it certainly is where I come from. You know, like where you have very strong convictions and opinions and I come from a culture of debate. Uh, I grew up as, a, as somebody where if you wanted to be somebody in, in high school, you had to make up opinions, you know, and try them out and kind of figure them out with each other. And I think the history of uh, philosoph philosophy that comes out of that culture is, is, we all know. So I think that there is, though, something else. I think that I, as a person, have an agency that um, I, I use and operate as a, in my life. You know, through my work, through my politics, through my political actions, and through my teaching, and all these kind of things. And um, and I also do work that is um, completely influenced by the values that drive me as, as an individual. Um, but it is um, what, it, what it invites is a discussion around really, I do work because I have really complicated questions in my head that I think are extremely necessary to debate. And that's, that's what the work does, which is something else. And if you and I go and have a, have a beer and we talk about politics, and talk about Obama or talk about who knows what, you know, then that's a different kind of space of communication than I have uh, when I make work. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think probably all of us, I mean, I, I, I'll speak for myself, but I think from what Andre just said and knowing what Bob, I think we're all very partisan in our views and, and have strong opinions. And then the work is actually, hopefully, when it's good, more complex than that. I mean, the, the ironic thing for me, when I did Dred Scott Decision, several people um, interpreted the work, oh, so what you really want me to do is go out and vote for Obama. I'm like, well, that's not what I intend in my personal life, but if that's, after thinking through the issues of the work you feel, then okay. I mean, I'm, that wasn't the sort of intent of the work, but I didn't want people to confront the questions of why they're voting and the implications of that, including in the history of this society. And so I think that, that when work is good, it's actually posing questions. And the, the, the point of the artist is we sort of very, sort of in a partisan strident way, call the question. We say, we're gonna actually initiate a dialogue about this. And then hopefully there's enough complexity within the work to allow freedom for people to come from different perspectives and engage those questions. And, and, yeah. and I have to say, to make the work good, it's really hard work. I remember when I had to, uh, a game called, uh, uh, a game uh, about shooting uh, Saddam Hussein and then turning to shoot <laughs> President Bush, and then I hacked it myself and inserted myself as the virtual jihadi. It wasn't generating so much uh, engagement. So, um, anonymously, I picked up the phone and I called the, the person who 
uh, generate the game and I was outraged with him on the phone about this artist hacking his game and turn it to a jihadi game and that triggered a whole response from so many people and brought them to engage with them. See what I mean about getting the word out? <laughs> so I just want to say also that uh, from the perspective of the museum, we're working together obviously, um, I think that there can be a <clears throat> some kind of value in, in appearing nonpartisan. And that, for example, that some of the most uh, interesting dialogue that's happened to any show uh, at the Queen's Museum was a highly controversial show about a Robert Moses that took on, that asked a bunch of very complicated questions. Um, so you disagree? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I don't hear it. I want to hear it. Why? You want to, yeah, yeah, she disagrees. Yeah, I disagree. I've been waiting think, for this moment. <laughs> yes. I don't. I don't agree that it's a. Um, I think that nonpartisanship is a fiction, and it's yes. Americans are really good at that. Drives me nuts. Like as a jo somebody who's a, trained as a journalist, um, like to have this whole notion of objective reporting, like that would. I think it just but doesn't I make didn't sense. I say I was nonpartisan. I said it's no, no, valuable no. to appear not. Yeah, because here. It, that's, yeah, okay, so, so the thing is that the, so the thing is that if you, if you, know, if you put your cards on the table too quickly, and I think you guys as artists do this. You're not saying here's what you should think. You are saying let's ask some interesting questions, and you know you get to it. You have to get to it. But, but there is. Let, let me say just like one thing. There is a value of appearing not participant because at some point when you know you are engaging people. The hardest thing is to step aside and watch that platform because you don't want it to interfere too much. It, then you are start imposing. But it is valuable to step aside and say, okay, I initiated that, but at the same time, I'm going to let it play and then monitor it. Right, but the other thing, hold on one second, I also want to say, I'm not an, an artist. I'm doing this as a museum director, right? So it's an institution that invites artists and they can be partisan, but if you put a collage of different kinds of partisanship together, then you have this, you know, that's, that's the platform. No, but I think that's, that's the problem. I think yeah. it's really the problem here that I experience. Yeah. That, that we have to, uh, for me there's a huge um, gradation between non appearing nonpartisan and being dogmatic, right? The, there's, a, there's a huge array of things, and I think we should, Look at, I'm all for strategy. You're talking about, if we're talking about strategy, I do a lot of things, you know, to get to a place that are strategic. Um, but I think as, as practitioners and institutions, I wish actually that institutions would be that more, do more of that, is that it's so important to uh, establish a set of um, values, or a process of values um, from which one works, and to make those transparent and to put them up for debate. Yes, that is it. Just saying, let me answer. <laughs> um, having, you know, putting forth a set of values, when you say partisanship, when I hear the word partisanship, I think that that has to do with taking a sp very specific set of political uh, positions. And the thing is that the, the, those political positions might be interestingly uh, <clears throat> sort of inquired about, right? So if you talk about values, like, I think that, the, it, you know, we've said repeatedly over and over again that we want to be the most community uh, engaged museum in America. So that, that we have a value that has to do with community engagement. We have, uh, you know, this openness that we're trying to pursue, so which has to do with having our therapists on our staff and community organizers and that kind of stuff. So that, that our values in terms of openness and engagement with a whole spectrum of communities in our uh, neighborhood are quite clear. That's different in our position, in our situation, what partisanship would mean for us in Queens, for example, would mean taking a particular set of political stances which would alienate parts of, the, of our audience and not. That's what but but you, I mean, as an institution, you alienate parts of the audience that, norm, that say, for example, mostly like what goes on in the Met. I mean, you don't show old work, you don't show classical work, you don't show the old masters. You show this like 
funky contemporary star flirter. People have thousands of tin cans dropped on their head, or other people organize political movements um, and call that art. And I mean, you know, it's, and I, I really, I think we should listen to this foreigner who says, look, you guys need to take a stand. It's a real problem in America where you people just pretend you have no uh, positions and you just try and be all things to all people when that's absolutely not true. The work that most of us do, at least until recently and even mostly now, isn't showing in the most mainstream places. What's showing in the most mainstream places is stuff that is much more conservative than this. And, and, and yet we pretend that, that all these institutions are neutral. They are not. Your institution isn't, and actually part of what I like about your institution is that you're not neutral. Yeah, but if I, if I were to, well, okay. Oh, do you mind if I break in really fast? Yeah, We're going over okay. time a little bit. Right. Let's, let's get the last, this okay. is a great one conversation. One more question and then but Let's do one last question. But I really just, by the way, I have to say, <laughs> no, no, no. This is, uh, you know, I always try to disagree. I think that we actually finally got to a disagreement. And I, love, and, so, and I do love that. I can also just put yeah. this foreigner as an American citizen. Yeah. Um, so I'm speaking from my own society. <laughs> history. Yeah, as we all have as yes. Americans, except our indigenous uh, colleagues and friends, you know. Um, I do think that, there, again, there is this, um, what, what I think is important to say is to have a conviction and to have a, a set of values as an institution or as an individual um, does not mean that you have to be intolerant to the other positions. You know, it's this incredibly valuable idea of organizing across difference. This idea of consensus, again, consensus building drives me nuts. Like this idea that we have to, that organization is only possible through a, a, a creation of consensus is, is difficult politically. Like what we have to learn is to be like, okay, I have a set of values, I recognize um, you don't. You be, disagree. We have a different idea of what an organization or an institution should do. Um, so how do we reconcile that and how do we learn from each other and, and engage each other instead of just being tolerant, which is the other problem, no, 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 right? No, no, so like, this is, I think, the potential just, of this, acknowledging yeah. this difference right. and working with it actively is so, where yeah, the good yeah. potential lies. Right. So, and, so just, and then I promise you. <laughs> so, but I think that there's radical possibilities cooperation. And that's, so that's what my book is about. Last question from the audience. And if you want to buy it, it's available. Oh, quiet. <laughs> we'll take that a little <laughs> Okay. Thank you all for sharing your work. It's really interesting in your conversation as well. Um, I'm really interested in trauma in relation to art, and I wanted to bring sort of an ethical question about that. And so Wafa, I know, I don't know if that's how you pronounce your name, but um, you started out by telling the story about when your brother died and kind of process, taking a while to process that and then coming up with this piece. And in your piece there, you know, like you're going through this trauma of being shot at, people are going through the trauma of having shot at someone and having to confront that. And you know, in your piece, people are walking by dogs barking at naked people, you know, like, how, what do you see as the ethics of using that in your work? Um, do, does the theme of accountability tie in, that you're accountable to yourself process some of this trauma that you see needs to be addressed in the world? Um, yeah, so that's kind of the question. How does that relate with the audience, with the performer, with the artist? Well, to be very honest, I um, was not thinking about trauma at all uh, when I started shooting in Iran. Um, but that, um, helped me um, in a way it was unexpected. Uh, when you lose uh, somebody, uh, you deny you lost them, and there is no acknowledgement because what we do, we build these barriers, emotional barriers, to protect ourselves from acknowledging the losses. Only when I become vulnerable, physically, emotionally, and I remember at day ten. I totally broke down, hid, in, hid behind the desk, and he cried my eyes out. For the first time, I acknowledged my losses because the situation I put myself in made me vulnerable into acknowledging the losses. Then there was a, a whole set of a drama started after the project itself, and I acknowledged it on day 30th when I said, Okay, the project is over, 
But there are so many problems I have to deal with. And for so many years after that uh, project, I went into therapy. I was on medication because uh, being shot 24 hours for 30 days, 70,000 uh, shots through that time, it was traumatizing. But if you think about it, that was a many conflict zone created in the comfort zone. So very much mimic Iraq and it transformed me, maybe not physically, but mentally where my family existed. Um, and, and on that point, Wafa's got a really great book called Shooting Iraqi that gets into the peace war. Nice. And it's really an amazing, amazing book and I would encourage people to get it. Um, and as far as my work, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I'll say it again, you know, this is a profoundly polarized world where a tiny handful controls the wealth and knowledge that humanity as a whole has created. There is tremendous division and polarization in this society, and there is tremendous trauma that many, many people have the privilege of, so, of ignoring, both historically but in present day. And a lot of times, I mean, I really like the way you talked about history and the present. I mean, I, I talk about my work as often um, looking at history, but also how the his, history resides in the present in new form. Um, and I, I think that one of the things is that, you know, the, the, the history of dogs, um, both during sort of slavery, but also the Jim Crow era, and black men and, and nakedness and vulnerability is something that people sort of see in historic context, but they don't see in the present day. And sort of subjecting the audience to both confronting that, but also the really loud barking dog. I mean, it was, the piece was about an hour and 10 minutes, and it felt much, much longer. And the, and the performers who were being barked at, had, uh, it, I mean, it was very traumatic for them, um, but also very liberating at the same time. And so I, I think that this thing of, you know, given this polarization and division, making work that talks powerfully about that sometimes makes people uncomfortable, and that's okay. In fact, in a certain sense, if you're not uncomfortable with the way the world is, you really aren't paying attention, because it is just truly a horror. Which doesn't mean we just like be sad and say, oh, bad, it's so horrible, we can't do anything. Hopefully the point of the work is it enables you to see it and then get to a place where you can try and transform the situation. So. And I want to add one thing about vulnerability and putting the body in the performance. I very often say the body has its own language. And what I mean by that, there is the idea of immediacy of performance, and like any other form, every other art of it's mediated by some form of media. While performance, when you put the body on a stage or in the context of the performance, what do you do when you activate the viewer by immediately and that it's a language the body understands. So yes, there is a heavy price, but then the objective of the artist is noble by activating others in a by social condition. Yeah. Where's that? Thanks. Um, so I, before you clap. No, 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 no. Okay, so clap. <laughs> but since you insisted on clapping, I have to say something. <laughs> Which is just that uh, it's really been a real pleasure. I don't know if you guys know what Blade of Grass is. I'm a board member. And to see Floyd Blade of Grass kind of trying to figure out how to talk about some of these issues and support it and sort of really be self critical, it's been really fun working with you guys. And do you want to come up and do you want yeah, any more announcements and stuff? Okay. Uh, just one last thing. I, I just, all I want to do is, my name is Deborah Fisher. I'm the executive director of Blade of Grass. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, we're not ending the conversation. We're just beginning it, right? Get a glass of wine. Meet the artists. I want to thank uh, all four of you. This was a really tremendous conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay.